<clears throat> Good morning. This is uh, Pastor Nate Perrin of Mountain Friends. Uh, I felt kind of bad um, explaining uh, my perspective before we dive into uh, the Bible study because I never got really a chance to explain it. Uh, I'm obviously coming from a Quaker uh, perspective. And um, there's going to be a good 25% of the time where you are going to disagree with me uh, unless you're a Quaker or an Anabaptist. Uh, I just want you to know up front, I don't, I would still see you as a brother or sister um, in Christ if you uh, disagree with me. It's not something that's going to cause me to shove you away, but uh, this is where my heart's at. Um, I believe that, uh, we should always be trying to worship a Jesus looking God. Um, if I am taking the new Testament seriously. So, uh, when we approach something as messy, uh, as the old Testament, uh, you're going to hear a lot of different things probably that you, uh, that are going to probably challenge you a bit that are probably going to push you a little boundaries. And I want you to know that uh, the only way we can learn together is if we share these different ideas with each other and figure out a way to converse, frankly, without escalating. Uh, I actually had to take a class specifically um, on the Quaker and Anabaptist perspective of the Old Testament. And it was probably one of the best classes I've ever taken. Uh, it helped me appreciate the Old Testament a whole lot more. But if you hear something different, uh, it's because I'm coming from that place where I am looking for a Jesus-centered God, or Jesus-looking God, even in the Old Testament. And how can we see that cross-shaped love there? So... Um, Today's passage is going to be Deuteronomy 5. If you're following along in the Illuminate series, it's going to be on page 38. Um, I'm going to go ahead and open us up in prayer. Dear Lord, uh, we thank you for the time we've been given. Uh, we pray for a sense of peace and uh, comfort during this season. Uh, we lift up all those who we know perhaps are dealing with the virus or the consequences of someone having the virus. And Lord, we pray for a sense of uh, healing for many people who are feeling despair. Uh, help us all see your agape love for us. In Jesus' name, amen. So Deuteronomy 5, uh, 4-21. Uh, we'll be starting on page 38 in this. So this is the uh, Ten Commandments. And if you don't know what the Ten Commandments are, they are the summary of what the Torah is going to be pretty much uh, for the ancient Hebrews. They weren't meant for other cultures. They were just meant for the Hebrews. So if... You know, last week in the devotional video, I mentioned how these other gods, uh, their neighbors, were pretty barbaric. And uh, I never really got into depth in that. Uh, so what these other area gods were doing was that uh, they would be doing child sacrifices, or they would be drinking the blood of their enemies, or uh, just something completely out there, and it usually involved the taking of uh, innocent life. Um... So, the Ten Commandments are a way to help guide the Hebrews as they're strangers in a strange land. Uh, they're going to be encountering a lot of their neighbors who are more polytheistic, or the fact that they worship many gods. Um, and many of these gods will be gods that are uh, just require them to be the absolute worst possible versions of themselves in order to get a favor or a blessing. Uh, we think this is bizarre, but just kind of look at even how some uh, people who claim to be Christians, like uh, the things they pray to God for uh, to justify, you know, bigotry, to justify anything. Uh, you know, we tend to be people who think <clears throat> uh, we put ourselves first. We don't put God first. That's what I'm trying to say. 
So with the Ten Commandments, it was a way for the Hebrews to look back and see what their communities were going to be about. Uh, it wasn't mainly just for individual uh, application. It was for people living in community. Uh, it was never meant to be a law for other cultures to use. So if you actually look at this, uh, you'll see this idea that you are not going to be like those other cultures that take innocent life. You're going to be following me and you'll be following me into this new place. And if you notice the Hebrews, they are so desperate to have God be like those other gods. Um, that they put this image on him where he is forced to have to work with them where they're at. And that's why you see a lot of issues like slavery uh, in the Bible. Because uh, God is meeting them where they're at uh, as a heavenly missionary. Uh, to love them and, uh, you know, just to grow. Uh, I like to think of the Hebrews as being like toddlers in faith. Uh, they didn't really know better, so God has to work with them where they're at, with their understanding of who he is. And even Jesus corrects this with like teachings about divorce. Where he says, uh, God gave us those rules because uh, that's what we could handle at the time, pretty much. So when we see like these stuff that doesn't seem to fit with God's character, it's usually because the Hebrews really want God to be like the neighborhood gods. They really want God to be equally barbaric. They want the God to ask them to drink the blood of their enemies, you know, stuff like that. <clears throat> so, um, yeah, that's one of the probably controversial perspectives that uh, maybe make you uncomfortable. But I want you to uh, focus on verses 6 um, through 11. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Uh, look at verse 11. This is one of the most commonly misunderstood verses uh, from the Ten Commandments. Um, this isn't talking about someone who says GD, as uh, they accidentally crash into the garage. Um, this isn't for people, you know, who uh, have those kind of weak moments and they just, they flip off the sky pretty much. Uh, no, this is about Pete, Yahweh marking his people and saying, you're going to be carrying my name where you're going. So this is how you live out that name. This is all a part of putting scripture into context instead of taking it out. Uh, most modern uh, understandings is that it's all about the language we use. But if we look at this in context, it's we're going into this area where other people are worshiping these other gods. So you need to be especially aware of how you live your life. Uh, to misuse the name of uh, Jesus, would, for instance, um, well, let's just use me as an example. Uh, if I were a drug addict or having an affair, uh, but I was supposed to be this ultimate representation of Christianity, I've used Jesus' name in vain. Uh, there's nothing he really can forgive uh, when we repent, but it's just one of those things where it's not necessarily with your language, it's with the way you live. And that's both a comforting and a challenging thing, I think. Uh, because they're going into this new place and uh, they have to be aware that the lives they live matter uh, in the context of where they're going. So verses uh, 14 through 21, I'm not going to read them all, but I'm just going to kind of list uh, the ways that they're not supposed to be taking that name in vain. 
Um, we first have uh, the Sabbath commands that are supposed to be set aside for them to rest. Uh, this is a, important to Hebrew culture, but it's something I think that's missed in Christian translation when uh, we try to apply it to our own lives. I th if there's one thing I admire the Seventh-day Adventist for, it's for being very intentional with Sabbath keeping. Uh, that's something I've had to struggle with in the past. Obviously, it's kind of forced on me now. Uh, I think it's forced on all of us. But uh, this is something that's very important to the heart of God, that we take moments of rest in Him. Uh, verse 15. Remember that you are a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out from there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. Uh, so God is telling the Hebrews, I know better than you. I helped you get out of this situation. I was there for you in your despair. Uh, please keep these commandments. And the rest of the verses are, uh, just verses about how we treat the community, how we treat our relatives, how we treat our neighbors. And there's some, uh, obvious ones like don't kill, uh, don't commit adultery, uh, don't lie. Uh, don't desire in your heart your neighbor's property because your heart is supposed to be with God. It's not supposed to be looking um, at what your neighbor do is doing. It's supposed to be looking at what you're doing, right? So uh, the Ten Commandments were kind of these boundary lines of where the Hebrews could not cross. Uh, if they crossed it, they knew that there was something wrong. Uh, with their own spiritual faith and with the way they were treating the community members. Uh, the way they interacted with God was as a community. Uh, I think it's something we lose as an American church. Uh, but if we live as like this kind of community, what would that look like for us today? And obviously some of these commandments probably couldn't apply to us equally. Um, but, you know, that's for a whole other discussion. So I'm going to go ahead and jump to Deuteronomy 6. Uh, 4 through 9 and 10, 12 through 22. Uh, we're on page 40. Uh, and again, I'm only going to be reading a few verses. Uh, verse 5 of Deuteronomy 6. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart. Um, I'm going to go ahead and jump to verse 7 because this is uh, really good. Oh, 7 through 9, actually. Recite them to your children and talk about them when you are at home and when you are away. Uh, when you lie down and when you rise. Bind them as a sign in your hand. Fix them as an emblem on your forehead. And write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Uh, this is kind of the Shema. Um, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is God, the Lord alone. This is to remind them that God was present with them, even in their darkest depths. Uh, and uh, modern Jews still kind of observe this. They put a uh, blessing. It's a good... I can't remember the name of it, but they screw it on uh, above the doorpost. And they, uh, it's like a form of prayer where they touch it before they leave. It's like this big. And uh, this is... a. Uh, Kind of just saying, love the Lord your God with your entire life, once again. Uh, in verse 5, let's read it together. Uh, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your might. So we're loving God with our entire being. It's just not something that's coming from the heart. Uh, so let's go ahead and jump to Deuteronomy 10. And I'll be reading... Verses 17 through 22. Uh, the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who is not partial and takes no bribe, who executes justice for the orphan and the widow, who loves the stranger, providing them food and clothing. You shall also love the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. You shall fear the Lord your God, him alone you shall worship. To him you shall hold fast, and by his name you shall swear. He is your praise, he is your God, who has done for you 
these great and awesome things that your own eyes have seen. Uh, your ancestors went down to Egypt 70 persons, and now the Lord your God has made you as numerous as the stars in heaven. Excuse me. There's a lot to unpack here. But let's start with the obvious. Uh, these Hebrews were slaves, and God delivered them. And he is asking them to remember him in this new strange land. Uh, he is saying that you are going to encounter the most vulnerable among you. And it is your duty as people who have been delivered from slavery uh, to love on them. To treat them as if I, how I treated you. Um, there are 4,000 verses and passages in the Bible about poverty... Uh, about God's seeking for justice for poverty, about God's judgment on people for mistreating the poor. Uh, and if you're someone that's sitting there thinking, oh, well, the Bible says a whole bunch of other things that sounds like social gospel, um, I challenge you to look at other topics in the Bible that tend to be hot topics right now. Uh, look at verses uh, about hell, for instance. Uh, there's a, usually, I think, about 70 um, depending on how you interpret things, how you interpret the right words, because there's four different words for how uh, in the Bible. Uh, look at verses about the Trinity. There's about 200 uh, references to the Trinity or an implications that there's something going on, uh, such as when Jesus refers to uh, God as the Father um, and having distinct roles. Um, look at verses about uh, communion and baptism. There's only about 15 communion verses and about 20 verses about baptism. Um, and don't get me wrong, I believe the whole Bible. Uh, I'm not here today to overturn tables on basic Christian foundations. But what I am saying is that even if you added all those things together, uh, it can't even fully measure how important it is for us to take care of the poor. How important it is for us. To be present. For the hurting. Uh, because we are bearing God's name. Uh, because this is the ultimate way. We outreach to people. This is the ultimate way we represent them. And it's by the way we are supposed to be training the marginalized. Um, <clears throat> if we were to do things. Completely God's way. Uh, I think it would look. A very different from the way we tend to think outreach needs to be done. But he kind of lays out the format. Take care of the orphan and widow. Uh, love the strangers. Pray, uh, be there for the people who are in despair. And uh, worship him with your entire being. That's the blueprint God gives out. Uh, when and you have to keep that in mind when reading the New Testament also because uh, the New Testament was m the majority written by Jews um, they the way they did things was not very extremely different from the way they've been doing uh, things all their lives pretty much and um, that's the ultimate form of it seems inner religion and inner spirituality for the Christian is the way they look out for the marginalized. Um, when we... Uh, it's very easy as American Christians to uh, come to this place of division, to come to this place where uh, we see a certain group as the problem. And it's always easy to find a new group to not trust or dislike uh, throughout history. It's always easy. Um, just look at the way Asian Americans are being treated right now uh, with the rise of violence against them. Um, look at the synagogue burnings happening in the States. Uh, look at the way the Arab population has had to deal with all the discrimination over the last 20 years. Uh, during my research at the uh, Syrian monastery in New Jersey, uh, they were very hesitant on me because most people in their area thought they were terrorists. This is a Christian monastery. So, um, 
yeah, we're not really living up to the test by any or potential we should be living up to. And God gives us the blueprint of how we should be living in a strange land. Because ultimately we are in Babylon, uh, wherever we go. Uh, we shouldn't be seeking control, but we should be seeking a lifestyle of service and humility uh, wherever we go. Uh, the, the New Testament was written for Christians um, in a minority uh, because God knew that wherever we would go, um, even in you know countries that proclaim Christianity, uh, the vast min or not vast minority, that's a really stupid statement, but the minority would be people who are trying to look like Jesus. And no matter who's in control, that doesn't change. So, <clears throat> when, um, whenever we're faced with this challenge of how then should we live, uh, look at verses like uh, Deuteronomy uh, 10, uh, 17 through 22. Look at the way Jesus interacts with the marginalized. Uh, look at how we're supposed to be called to worship God with our whole lives. Um, it never really matters our circumstances because those commandments seem to be eternal and universal. Take care of the marginalized. Watch out for them. Uh, we can always be tempted to find excuses. Um, and it's still something I'm learning about. Um, but... When uh, we take the time to really process and think about what this means for us as Christians today, it can be a scary calling. Um, and in times of fear like this, of um, COVID-19, we can take these opportunities to think uh, that just because everyone is in fear that we have to contribute to it. Uh we're called to be realists, but we're also called to be beacons of hope. And that's what the Hebrews were supposed to be doing in the land they were about to go into. So let's make sure we're worshiping a Jesus-centered God. Let's make sure we're being good bearers of his name. And let's always remember that the only way, the way we take his name in vain is if we do anything that contradicts the character of Christ. And unfortunately for some of us, that's an everyday thing. It's something I struggle with in my heart. But that's the beauty of Christianity. It's not like most people think. Um, an ending point of conclusions. You know, it's not a... I said the turn or burn prayer and then uh, go to church once a month or three times a month or whatever. It, whatever attendance. But it's a life completely submitted to God. It's a life that says, uh, I want to worship Jesus because he will know better than what I do, anything I can do. Um, and part of that is recognizing, uh, at least within myself, um, even though I grew up in and out of poverty all my life, uh, recognizing how much more I've been blessed than most of the world. Because I can't ever remember a time when there wasn't a roof over my head. Um, I can't ever really remember a time uh, when my water was shut off. Uh, I can remember a few times when the heat went out. But um, I, still, I still have it better than most people. Even in my suffering. So, um, even though the Hebrews went through a lot, God wants them to remember... Uh, what they went through, and uh, to not shun away other people just because they think their suffering's different. Uh, they're supposed to be radical and welcome in the stranger, welcome in the orphan, welcome in the uh, widow, because uh, he is communicating that that is where his heart is. I could rant about this all day because, you know, <clears throat> I'm getting my uh, uh, doctorate in. Uh, Christian community development, and this is what the ministry is all about. So, uh, this is what the, like the tenants are, um, and it's a weird journey getting to this point. But uh, you know, loving the loving the marginalized is what I'm about. Loving the other, and if we uh, 
if we're too uncomfortable with that as uh, Western Christians, then something was wrong in our translation or down the line. We should always be looking to get back to the roots of where God's heart is at. All right, so I'm at 25 minutes, which means uh, this is longer than my sermon. So I'm going to be kind of concluding off. If you have any thoughts, uh, go ahead and give me a call or uh, 608-983-2262 or 715-721-0229 uh, is my cell. Obviously, I'm homebound. Um, or you can reach out to me through Facebook. Um, if you're watching this for the first time, I want you to know that you're not alone and that uh, God is with you uh, throughout all this. And that uh, churches everywhere are trying to figure out ways to outreach to their community. Uh, so even if you don't reach out to our church, reach out to a church. Uh, just to get that connection. Just to make sure you're not isolated. Uh, because we're all in this together. And um, loneliness was an epidemic before this. And um, the reason I broke my heart to close down church for a while is because I recognize that loneliness is a huge problem. And that mental health is a huge problem. So I want you to be aware constantly of these resources. And that we're always here for you. Um, and that Fountain Friends is a church that welcomes everyone. That anyone who comes into our door can feel that safety. Can feel that grace that God offers us to each, offers to us each day. So please, please don't be afraid to reach out. Even if you're not a Christian. Um, I'm here. I'm supposed to be loving you. So please don't be afraid to reach out. Uh, we're always a phone call away. Uh, let's go ahead and close in prayer. Dear Lord, uh, we thank you for this time you've been giving. Uh, thank you for uh, the word you've given us today. As we wrestle with the complex issues in uh, the Bible, always make us aware of where our hearts and responses should ultimately be. And that's with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Grace and peace. Go wash your hands.